Good morning, everybody. Welcome et bienvenue. My name is Stephen Kress, Director of Training and Consulting for the OLS. Today, we embark on a journey of perspectives together. As the Ontario Library Service team and our esteemed presenters bring you Stronger Libraries, Stronger Communities 2022, our virtual conference. On behalf of Melissa D'Onofrio Jones, our CEO, our board of directors, and our staff team, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's exciting program. Our event wouldn't be possible without your input, contributions, and the participation of all our public libraries across the province. In today's exciting program, we hope that we will be able to challenge you and pull you out of your comfort zone a little bit, provoking a variety of new perspectives that you may be adding to your personal list throughout the day. I'd like to take a few moments uh, and remind you, of course, uh, to use the lobby as we're going through today's program. You'll find all our sessions, as you did and entered this morning, uh, posted to the left-hand side of the screen. You'll also find a little bit of information about our Excel program and the successful libraries who, who completed their recent Ontario Public Library Guidelines and Accreditation Council reaccreditations posted there, as we congratulate them for the hard work that they've accomplished this past year. Of course, uh, we'll also have some bookmarks in there as well to refer back to in the months ahead, post our program to, for you to be able to consult back on some of this information as well. A few housekeeping elements before we jump into today's program, of course, the lobby, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, is our central place to, to access all of our content today. Uh, each session will be individual, so anybody who is uh, who has uh, been with us previously, We'll note that uh, we previously ran a, a straight ahead program throughout the day. That'll be a little different this, this year. So do pay attention to the lobby and all your links to join the in-session programs will be on the far left. The chat function today will be disabled for, for participants. However, the Q&A function will be available for you to pose any questions that you wish to our esteemed presenters who will be with us throughout the day's program. And of course, last but not least, a reminder that we, of course, will be recording today's content and be posting this in the weeks to come. Expect some communication in a later October, announcing the release of all the videos from today's sessions for your enjoyment and for your use for further training and reference. So today, I'd like to begin our, our, our conference with, a, with our land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge the fact that there are over 630 Indigenous communities across Canada. The OLS works and provides services across the entirety of Ontario, which represents numerous treaties, territories, and lands of various Indigenous peoples. My family, they came from France and Austria. Many of my ancestors traveled to Canada as explorers, as immigrants, as workers, and participated in the development of North America, often to the de detriment of the Indigenous way of life. I recognize that some of my ancestors, although perhaps well-intentioned in their times, having come to Canada to build different lives from, and from their experiences that they left back in their home countries, weren't in a position to properly recognize or acknowledge the value and the presence of, of Canada's First Nation peoples as society evolved in their eras. As an inhabitant of various First Nation territories across the province throughout my life, I have been fortunate to share experiences and learn from many First Nation peoples and elders. Those moments and those experiences and teachings for me have that they have graciously shared with me over the years and their traditions uh, have marked my life in a very important way. Those experiences remain extremely valuable to me as I continue my journey in reconciliation and learning. I'm also fortunate to have had an opportunity to hunt, fish, and adventure on, over the course of my life on numerous lands that were once home to First Nation peoples across our province. As the OLS, we work to foster a culture of development and strengthening communities and libraries. We do this through a positive lens of growth and, of course, focused on our presence as we move forward across the province with our staff team as we continue to learn, listen, and grow with our First Nation public libraries. We do our very best to translate the experiences that we've learned as the OLS to, the, to cross, the, cross that over and to benefit all public libraries across the province through a framework of reconciliation together. So please join us as the OLS as you listen, learn, and experience from, our, from Indigenous knowledge that resides in your areas and regions across the province. We invite you to connect, dialogue, and join with your First Nation peoples to move forward to real change, true reconciliation, with First Nation peoples across the country and the world. So Nancy, I'll hand things over to you. 
Thanks, Stephen. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Cooper. I'm from the Chippewas of Rama First Nation, and I am one of the First Nations consultants here at the OLS. Um, on behalf of all of us at OLS, we'd like to thank you for your support and for joining our keynote session with renowned author David Robertson. David was the 2021 recipient of the Writers Union of Canada Freedom to Read Award. He's the author of numerous books for young readers, including When We Are Alone, which won the 2017 Governor General's Literary Award and the McNally mm -hmm. Robinson Best Book for Young People Award. The Barren Grounds, the first book in the middle grade, the Misewa Mis Mis Saga series, received a starred review from Kirkus, was a Kirkus and Colin Fire Best Middle Grade Book of 2020, was a USBBY and a Texas Lone Star selection, was shortlisted for the Ontario Library Association Silver Birch Award and was a finalist for the 2020 Governor General Literary Award. His memoir, Blackwater, Family, Legacy and Blood Memory was a Globe and Mail and Quill and Choir Book of the Year in 2020 and won the Alexander Kennedy Isbister Award for Nonfiction as well as the Carol Shields Winnipeg Book Award at the 2020 Manitoba Book Awards. On the trap line, illustrated by Julie Flett, won David's second Governor General Literary Award and was named one of the best picture books of 2021 by the Canadian Children's Book Centre, The Horn Book, New York Public Library, Quill and Choir, and American Indians in Children's Literature. David is the writer and host of the podcast, Key Will, winner of the 2021 RTD and a Prairie Region Award for Best Podcast. And he currently holds four positions for four titles on the Winnipeg bestsellers list. <laughs> he is also a member of the Norway Cree First Nation and currently lives in Winnipeg with his family. It's my pleasure to welcome you, David, to today, today's conference. And I'm now gonna hand everything back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, appreciate the introduction. I'm happy to be here um, for the Ontario Library Service. Um, I, I have a, a, a lot of respect for uh, teachers and librarians and teacher librarians. Um, so it's always um, you know an honor to speak to speak to you. And um, I, I thought what I would do today is talk to just briefly about myself beyond just the, the stuff that makes me blush and then um, my work and then really focus in on um, the importance of developing positive perceptions and um, including multiple pers perspectives um, and the impacts of positive and negative representation in, in literature. Um, and then maybe some calls to action at the end. And uh, I, one of my favorite parts of any presentation is to take questions. So at the end, if anybody does have questions for me, um, I'd be happy to answer them for you. So good morning and uh, let's, let's get started. So uh, my name's Dave uh, and I, uh, I'm a writer. I've been doing this professionally for about 13, 14 years now. Um, I started when I was in my early thirties. Um, I've had, I don't count, but I've had, um, I think about over maybe 25 or so books published uh, across multiple forms and genres. Um, and that's something that is really important for me, not only um, to develop my skills as a writer, but more importantly, to reach a wider audience because of the um, goal that I have for my work, which is to educate and is to motivate and inspire mostly youth. So you notice that a lot of my work, if not, you know, I would say about 90% of my work is for children. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a very deliberate choice for me. Um, and I'll talk to you about that in a little while, but I will say that you know youth are agents of change, uh, and um, they do deserve our full attention um, to make sure that they uh, are working towards the kind of change that we need to see in this country. And um, 
so I, I do have a couple of adult books uh, out like Blackwater and uh, I said the theory of crows come out uh, last week or so, um, but the majority of my work is for children and it's, it is for that reason. Um, and over the course of my career, um, you know, I've done a lot of public speaking and more and more over the last several years um, that speaking has focused on advocating for access to diverse literature um, to make sure that you know, as much as I want Indigenous children to read stories that positively represent them, um, where they can see themselves reflected in literature, um, but also so that any kid in any classroom, in any library, um, can take, pick up a book and read uh, about a main character who shares their background, who shares um, lived experiences um, so that they can feel, feel seen and valued. Um, you know, everybody should read a book and feel like they also can save the world. And um, I really feel very strongly about that. And, um, and I also would say that part of my work as I've gotten more and more gray hairs is to make sure that other new new and emerging writers have opportunities that that I have had to share their work um, because we need their voices, you know. And and what I would say to that is that I, you know, um, Nancy had mentioned that I had four books on the bestseller list this week in Winnipeg. I usually have a couple on, on the national bestseller list, but I I don't like to see that it's the same writers week to week to week to week. Um, and I, you know, I'm I'm really proud of my friends. Uh, most of them are my friends on that list. Um, you know, whether it's Josh or Shree or Eden or, um, you know, or people we've lost like Richard Wagamese and Tom King, uh, who is a big hero of mine. But uh, we need to have diversity and more depth in that representation as well. So we need more new and emerging writers on those lists. And that's why I was so happy to see a friend of mine, uh, Tasha Spillett Sumner, who uh, had a uh, her picture book on the New York Times bestseller list, which is which was phenomenal. And so we need we need more of that. Um, so that that's just a little bit about my, my work, um, just expanding on some of it. And, uh, you know, I, I guess just so you know a bit more about my own cultural background, uh, I am Cree. Uh, and my dad was born and raised in Norway House Cree Nation, so that is also my band member. I'm a, my my band. I'm a band member of Norway House Cree Nation, and that's something that I'm really proud of. Um, wasn't always that way though, and I'll talk to you about that as well. I thought that what I would say, no, um, I sorry, I, I, if it came across that I'd said that Thomas King was passed away, uh, it was just in the same sentence as mentioning Richard Wagamese. Thomas King is alive and well. So um, yeah, <laughs> so I didn't want to scare anybody there. Uh, he no, we have the same agent, and he is uh, he's he's still there. He had a great graph that all come out earlier this year called Borders, um, and uh, it, it was nominated for the TV Canadian Children's Literature Award. I, I read him when I was uh, younger, and um, I think about him a lot because there were very few writers who were Indigenous having work, work published in the '80s and the '90s, um, and so they opened doorways. And this is what I'm talking about for advocacy. Like they open doorways for people like me to do the work that I do. And I think that we have that same responsibility to open doorways so that newer and emerging writers have the opportunities that we have. And, uh, and so I think a lot of it is opening doors and making sure that we, um, we, we, there's more tomorrow doing this work than there are today. Um, and, and that's the progress. That's the, the, the more of us that find success, um, the more kids will be inspired to um, do the same sort of work because they realize that they can do it too. Um, you know, I was, I was at a, a gym assembly in Pegasus First Nation a couple of years ago. And to the, to the point, um, after the presentation, uh, kids were filing out of the, the gymnasium and one kid uh, in middle years uh, came up to me and just tapped me on the shoulder and, and said, Mr. Robertson, can I ask you a question? And I you know, said, of course. And he goes, I, I want to be a writer like you now. 
And that is like, to me, like, that's what it's all about, right? So um, that's what gets me going. And that's what makes me uh, warms my heart and gives me hope um, for what's coming in the future. So um, I, I think that what I would want to do starting out was um, to address a, a kind of an elephant in the room, and um, they're connected. So I'm going to talk about Jerem in a little while. But um, this actually wasn't the first time that I had a book, a book uh, or books um, taken off shelves. Um, a few, and and in my bio, it mentioned that I've uh, been awarded the Freedom to Read Award by the Canadian, uh, um, uh, the the Writers Union of Canada, and the that award came from what happened in Alberta, and kind of fight just fighting against the censorship uh, banning of literature. Um, and especially of literature by marginalized writers. Um, one day I got a, a notification from uh, somebody on Twitter um, who had pointed me towards a conversation that was happening where teachers were um, discussing a list that had just come out in Edmonton. And this list was a books to weed out list. And some of them were joking about it. Some of them were discussing its merits. Um, and some, you know, were, were, um, were feeling as though it was problematic. And when I looked, looked at the list, what I saw was that, um, almost the entire list was, um, books by Indigenous writers, uh, and they were books that were to be weeded, weeded out of Edmonton, um, classrooms, uh, Edmonton school classrooms. And so I, I this was really a disturbing and, and, um, really shocking to me. And so there, there was a, a huge um, kind of movement uh, against this banning of literature in Edmonton um, that I, I don't want to say I spearheaded, but I definitely was very vocal. Um, and it, it actually led to a realization that the entire province had banned a bunch of books uh, and a lot by me. Um, and so that, that was also something that um, it really, um, it grew the issue exponentially where um, I eventually had a conversation by, via email with the Minister of Education at the time, Dave, Dave Agins or Dave Eggers um, and an NDP uh, minister. Um, and I, you know, he, he had list, gave, gave me the list of the books that, I, that were being banned of mine. I, I say banned, um, he did, they don't like to use that word because I guess it makes them feel better. But when you, ostensibly, when you, when you um, put a list out that tells teachers these books are not recommended to be taught in the classroom. That's it's essentially banning that literature because teachers, you know, are, are, you know I had a few emails from teachers that were telling me um, and librarians that they um, were told not to teach or stock my books because of that recommendation. So, I mean, it's a soft banning if you want to call it soft banning. But um, so the conversation I had with him was first of all, like, why is this happening? Why are you doing this? And um, and the reasoning was really um, d difficult to to wrap my head around. Um, uh, you know, quickly one one of the reasons was that it misrepresented Native culture, uh, which I found really bizarre because there were books written by Indigenous writers about Indigenous people, um, and the de decisions were made by an all non-Indigenous community. Um, and it also required pre and post conversation in the classroom, which, you know. Um, teachers have that job to, to have conversations about the literature that they bring into the classroom and they teach their children. So I thought that was pretty insulting to educators as well. But when I, when I, when I, when I um, put forward these concerns to David, um, he never responded again. So um, a lot of this was fought through social media and on media channels. Um, and so, and, and then when all this started happening, when it was, and I don't ever really know actually what the outcome of it was, but um, I, I started to think about, you're hearing my dog there. Um, <laughs> um, I thought, how does this happen? How did it happen? Like, why did it happen? And when, when I really broke it down, what I felt was happening was, it was an issue that stemmed from historical representation of indigenous people in literature and popular culture. Um, you know, the either the lack of representation 
Um, you know, I, I remember when I was a child, like I read a lot and uh, I think about the books that I was reading when I was younger. And I off, I think about like the, the books I love the most and it wouldn't be surprising to anybody to know that um, who's read the Barren Grounds or the Great Bear, um, that portal stories were, you know, uh, books that I really loved. And um, Narnia was a series that I, I really gravitated towards when I was younger. Um, and uh, picture books by Maurice Sendak, I really, really, really loved. Um, and uh, my favorite book of all time is actually a book called Tom is Midnight Garden, which is a brilliant book. Um, but when I look at all of the books that I loved when I was a kid, it, as much as they influenced me as a writer in a positive way, um, I, I also noticed that all the characters are, are white. There's no diversity in, in, in the books. There's no real representation of uh, that reflects our community. Um, and, and, it, and it's not to say that having white characters is problematic. Um, what it is saying is that having only white characters is problematic because it doesn't represent the like a lot of children who are from diverse backgrounds. Um, and it teaches them through that lack of representation that there is they are not valued as much, that they are not worth uh, writing about as much. Um, and that does have an impact on self-confidence. Um, and I felt that myself. Um, the other thing I noticed when I look back at literature around that time, especially comic books, was the misrepresentation um, of Indigenous people. So if we were included in literature, what you would see is that um, we were boiled down to very common stereotypical representations. Uh, and that would be, you know, um, the bloodthirsty savage, um, the noble savage, the uh, dead Indian. Um, there's, there's tropes that um, Thomas King actually breaks down very well in in um, one of his books, um, it was, I'll think of it in a second, but um, it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a really important book um, and it talks about representation uh, in this way. Um, and so then uh, beyond that uh, and the impacts that that negative representation has and how it really boils down Indigenous people, first of all, as a monolith, but then also as something that, um, you know, as an indigenous person, you know, we don't want to identify as, um, and, and also there's perceptions that it shapes towards indigenous people. Um, there's also the acts of uh, appropriation uh, that happened in literature. And that is whether it's like a white actor, um, you know, uh, acting as an indigenous person or, superheroes in comic books wearing indigenous, um, you know, regalia, um, or, you know, uh, Superman wearing a headdress or Batman or Shazam or Rex the Wonder Dog, or, you know, all, all these main, all these big superheroes have all worn headdresses. Um, and there's actually a really, really problematic comic by action comics a long time ago, where Superman went back in time to um, convince an indigenous tribe to sell their land to white people. Um, and so that was, you know, that was <laughs> a, a problematic storyline. Um, and there's more of it as well, but I'm not gonna go over all of that. But so I look back at all the representation and appropriation um, historically, especially when I was a kid in the, in the 80s growing up. Um, and that's what I noticed. I noticed the lack of representation. I noticed the misrepresentation and I noticed the appropriation of indigenous cultures. And um, and over the years, like as I as I've thought more and more about these things, and um, I've written more and more about them. You know, I, one of the things that I do in my career is a bit of freelance journalism, and I often write about appropriation and uh, misrepresentation um, and or lack of representation. And as you can imagine, as a, as as a journalist, um, we get a lot of comments um, from the public. Um, they will either comment online if they have comments open, which I've advocated for with uh, news um, outlets to not allow comments on Indigenous stories because it does fuel a lot of racist comments. Um, but beyond, if that happens, they still seek you out is what I've, I've noticed is um, they'll still seek you out to give you their peace of mind. 
Uh, and so I'll get a lot of emails from people um, when I write articles like that. And what what it what the common question is asked through those emails is for I think more than anything is what's the big deal? You know, when you when you have a problem with uh, misrepresentation, when you have a problem with like uh, a kid dress putting a headdress on for Halloween or dressing up as Pocahontas, they say, "What's the big deal? Like, get over it." What does it matter if I dress my daughter up as Pocahontas for Halloween? What like what is it? What does that mean? What is that? How does that affect you? How does that affect anybody? Um, and then if if the emails are sent to me uh, and they really want a response and they aren't just you know trying to send over some vitriol, um, I answer them. And one of the things that I talk about is you know the the examples of the impacts of you know, that representation or appropriation, like, so the, the, the answer to the question, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. And, um, and you know, one of the, one of the things I, I speak most about is looking at the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, if you look at, you know, there's, there's, there's thousands of examples. Um, one of them is of Helen Betty Osborne, who is also from Norios Cree Nation, um, but she was a young woman and who was murdered in the 19, in 1971 um, in, in the Paw, Manitoba, or just outside the Paw, Manitoba. And the Paw, Manitoba at the time, like this, this was inevitable, this murder, um, and other Indigenous people were, um, were murdered in the Paw uh, around the same time, whether it's Indigenous men or women. Um, you know, Indigenous men were lured um, off uh, to the Saskatchewan bridge or the bridge over the Saskatchewan river and thrown off into the river um, as almost like sport. And um, indigenous women were um, the subject or targeted by uh, young men in the community because there was a perception of by those young men of who those indigenous women and girls were. Um, so they believed that they were easy, that they liked to drink, that they liked to party. And um, because of this, it gave them almost like this uh, sense of entitlement um, or expectation that uh, if they wanted to party with an ind indigenous woman or girl, that um, that it would be something that they would be easily able to do. Um, and so one night they tried to pick up Helen by the Osborne, and she said no to them. And um, and because of that, they actually just ended up kidnapping her. And bringing her out to a pump house by a lake and and murdering her, um, and the the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is widespread. It's a it's an issue across North America. Um, you know, thousands of Indigenous women and girls have been murdered or gone missing, and um, the question to me is is like why why is this happening? You know, obviously there's a lot of um, issues connected to that epidemic around systemic racism, uh, colonialism, uh, the impacts of colonialism. But it also comes down to appropriation. It also comes down to misrepresentation uh, and how Indigenous women and girls in popular culture have been romanticized or sexualized and how that representation shapes perceptions of Indigenous women and girls in real life. Um, so the answer to the question of, is up to what's the big deal is it is a huge deal. Um, and if you look at like a story like Helen Betty Osborne or, or a, like a, a Pocahontas, um, that story is actually incredibly disturbing, you know, in real life. Um, you know, Pocahontas, first of all, was an underage girl. You know, she was like, I think around 11 or 12 years old at the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a really disturbing and horrible story. Um, but Disney took it and romanticized it. Um, and so, so this, and, and, and so that's one example of many. And so it is a big deal and it does shape perceptions. And, and so we, when we go back to something um, like Alberta, you look at like, why were those decisions being made? Um, it, it's the root of it is, is comes from the same place. And that is that, you know, um, people in the eighties and nineties who were learning the same things that I was learning or not learning the, the same things that I was not learning um, grew up and went into leadership positions uh, into administration and were not prepared or knowledgeable enough to make appropriate decisions 
and made decisions based on their own base of knowledge, which was really skewed um, negatively because of the, the experiences that a lot of us had growing up and how we learned about Indigenous people through popular culture and the fact that a lot of the history was ignored in high school and, and junior high school and elementary school. You know, I, I would like to know if anybody in, great, in the 80s, for example, learned residential schools history at any point, at any grade, you know, and um, the fact that I could graduate from grade 12 and have no idea about what a residential school was, even though my grandmother was a survivor, um, is a huge failing. So there's massive failings across the board historically. And, um, and it leads to um, the, the perpetuation of continued um, decisions that harm, that cause harm. And, and make no mistake about it, when you pull books from the hands of kids and don't allow them access to truth, which these stories are, then it causes harm, you know, um, it causes harm because it, um, it um, removes the opportunity for kids to gather knowledge that would lead to positive action both today and tomorrow. I want to talk to you a little bit, a little bit about that in a few minutes. And I know that, oh my goodness, it's already 931. What, I always do this. <laughs> I could talk, I, I talk to you guys about this all day. Um, but so, so, and it leads to those decisions. And, um, and, and these, the impacts extend beyond education. It extends beyond books. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll move through this part a little quicker to get through, so I can get through everything within the hour. But, you know, you think about the justice system and its treatment of Indigenous people. You think about, you know, with, with Colton Bushy or Tina Fontaine and, the, and those acquittals uh, or, you know, the guy being found not guilty or shooting Colton Bushy in the back of the head. You know, that inequity within the justice system, um, the lack of justice in the justice system, uh, depending on who you are is something that stems from the same thing. Um, and it, within the healthcare system too, you know, I live in Winnipeg and um, around the same time that Sinclair, if you, if you Google this story, was left in the waiting room at the Health Sciences Center and, and left to die, uh, my auntie uh, experienced the same thing and passed away because she had lack of care. And um, you know, the question for me to anybody is, if you really are honest about um, the answer to this question is, in any of these situations, even in the Quebec, uh, the woman in Quebec who was made fun of as she was dying in a, in a hospital uh, who was Indigenous, if they were not Indigenous, would we have the same outcome? And if and I don't think you can say yes, and that's a problem, right? Um, if my auntie was not Indigenous, she would still be alive today. And that is a hard pill to swallow, but it, you know, one of the things I talk about with kid, with educators, librarians, adults is, um, you know, th there's this uncomfortability with truth. You know, uh, I did a I did a session recently with, with teachers, a professional de development session, because they, they wanted me to make teachers more comfortable with teaching this history. And my answer is, it's not comfortable. I can't make it more comfortable. I shouldn't make it more comfortable. It is uncomfortable. What we have to, what the goal I think is to be comfortable with 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 the uncomfortableness, you know, because truth uh, is not and shouldn't be comfortable. Um, and then even like you know things like Canada 150, you know, and I look back at that and I, there's a graphic novel that I was a part of in the development and a, had a piece and called uh, this place 150 years um, re retold. Uh, it was a graphic novel by High Water Press and that. Grafnell came from a conversation that I was having with the publisher and Catherine, Catherine Rimet, who I'm sure a lot, all of you should know, or, or, or a lot of you know of. Um, and we were just looking at this whole thing and we're like, like, why are we celebrating right now? And it's not that there aren't things about Canada that are good. You know, I'm, I'm lucky to be living in this country in a lot of ways, but there shouldn't be a caveat to the greatness of this country, if you know, if you know what I mean. This this country should not be great with the caveat of if you are white or if you are this. Um, it's not so great if you are indigenous or if you are black or if you are from the LGBTQI2S community. Um, if if we could get rid of those caveats, 
and we can truly say this this country is a country we can celebrate because it's equitable and safe for everybody that's the time when we should set off the fireworks you know and um and the other question the other thing we talked about was the, what could we be spending these billions of dollars on other than celebrations like how many communities could we be giving clean water to you know clean water to drink i don't think and, I, and the thing is canadians are pretty great the majority of canadians are great and i think if the government said you know what if we can um do a bunch of celebrations or give all the rest of the communities in this country clean drinking water, what would you prefer? I really believe that the majority of Canadians would say, I'll skip the fireworks. Let's get these communities clean drinking water. You know, that's the thing. I, I really believe that. Uh, and maybe I'm a little naive and a little bit too hopeful, but I, I've seen it enough. You know, I, I, I speak across Canada um, and I speak to ten, tens of thousands of people every year, uh, Canadians, and um, gosh, I, I really believe that. I really believe that we're better than that. Um, so, and and like this all, to me, it all boils down to is, and is a part of reconciliation. And, and reconciliation does not happen without access to truth. And, and within the context of this conversation, truth is positive representation. Truth is positive representation available through literature, you know, the, the books that we stock on our library shelves, in our classrooms, that we, that, we, that we bring into the curriculum, into classrooms, the choices that we make, the books that we make available, if they do have positive representation, then we see positive outcomes, you know, and, and you know, I, I know we've heard this probably a million times before, but books are mirrors and books are windows. You know, we, we want to have literature available to kids that, first of all, reflect them so that they feel valued, so that they feel like they have shared experiences with, with other people, um, so that they don't feel so isolated or alone. Um, and books are mirrors, so that our books are windows, so that we can see through and, and learn about people and their different experiences and our shared humanity. You know, one of the things that my dad and I used to talk about often was reconciliation. And what we believed it was, was um, a conversation where we sit down from across from each other, like we're doing right now. And I wish I could see all your faces, but um, we first of all, start from the point of, I don't know you unless I get to know you. You know, I don't know you unless I know you. And I shouldn't like have these preconceptions of who you are unless I really know who you are. And what, how do we do that? We just listen to each other. We share stories uh, and we recognize our differences and we, we recognize our similarities and also our differences and respect those differences. And it seems so simplistic, but I will tell you that if we only respected each other from the beginning, if we had that, if we worked towards acquiring the knowledge to just get to know each other and to respect the differences that we had in the ways that we lived, we would have none of the problems that we have today. There would never be residential schools. There would never be a mis misrepresentation, overrepresentation in the justice system or foster care. You know, um, a country would look a lot different than it does today. Um, and, and when we talk about representation and the books that we have available and what positive representation can do, um, we also have to understand, I think as well, just quickly as an aside is that, you know, we also need to stock diversity within indigenous literature. You know, indigenous people are not a monolith. And I mentioned that earlier, like there's diverse voices within indigenous cultures um, and we need to represent those as well, you know? And, um, and so the impacts, and I'll give you a couple of case studies of positive representation and what that looks like as I kind of begin to wind down and uh, think about taking questions. I, I want to talk about a couple of case studies, give you a couple of calls to action, and then uh, take some questions. Um, so, uh, and then these are books, these are examples from my own literature. Not to say my literature is the be all and end all. There are a lot of great marginalized writers out there doing a lot of great work. I'm just one of them. And I'm really proud to be in that community. Um, you know, uh, uh, with when, when We Were Alone, for example, which is a, a picture book I wrote for kindergartners, grade one kids about residential school history. 
A um, little bit of pushback on that one to start for my publisher, a great publisher. I love High Water Press. But, you know, at the time it was like, I wrote a book about residential schools for kindergartners and they were like, I don't think you can do that. Here's the thing. And what I said to them was, you just don't think we can do that because it has, it hasn't been done yet. So we need to be bold in our decisions. We need to be bold and we need to be steadfast in our, the goals that we have for the country that we want to develop. Um, and if somebody tells you that it's not possible, um, oftentimes it's because we just haven't seen the possibility. We haven't tried. We haven't tried yet. Uh, and so when we were alone was a book that proved that it is possible. And um, the first book, the first person I read this book to was my daughter, um, Lauren. And uh, when it came in, uh, we I opened my box and I pulled out when we were alone and um, uh, I read it to her and we uh, we read it together in bed before I tucked her in. And she was very quiet afterwards, uh, very kind of reflective. And um, I didn't really ask her much about it. Uh, she didn't ask many questions to me about it. Uh, it looked like, I think, you know, get a sense of when they want to talk about it and when they just want to like ruminate and sit with it. And so I said, well, we'll talk about it in the morning. So uh, I talked to her and she went to bed. The next day, my dad was coming over for brunch and um, he came over, walked in the house, sat in this chair that he had, that he used to sit in here in my house. And uh, she ran up to him and sat in his lap. And she said immediately, Grandpa, will you teach me how to speak Cree? And that never would have happened if it wasn't for the representation, first of all, of Cree culture and Cree people in that book, but also of the language, right? So she saw the language and through the story, she recognized the um, lack of um, the, the, the ways in which those schools prevented speaking Indigenous languages. And she wanted to break the cycle because she saw that grandpa speaks Cree. She saw that her dad, me, does not speak Cree. And she wanted to learn Cree because she recognized that there was a disconnect. That all happened because of a story. Stories are powerful. Stories and art save lives. You know, I, I really believe that. Um, on the other side of it, you know, what impact does that have on, on the non-Indigenous reader? Well, one of the first um, classes I read when, when we were alone to was a grade one class in Alberta, uh, appropriately. And, and so I, I, I read the book to the class. And before I got there, um, the teacher had read the book before me the week before. And she told me a story after I was done speaking to the kids and reading to the kids about what had happened the week before. And the, uh, the teacher told me how, that after class one day, um, a parent came up to pick up her kid and the parent went up to the teacher and very deliberately and, and said, what, what, what have you been reading my kid? And the teacher was a little nervous because, you know, she knew what, it, what the book was and she was, and it wasn't really being done at the time for kindergartners, grade one kids. So she showed the, the parent my book and she said, well, I read, I read the kids this book. And the parent told her that they had never learned about residential schools before. They didn't even know that they existed and this is an adult and their kid the night before taught them about residential schools and that is also an incredible example of the power of literature the power of truth and the capability of a child to create change children are incredible teachers they are incredible teachers both today and they're incredible teachers and in, they will be incredible teachers in the future um, and I'll tell you a very a library specific story um, before I get into some of the a couple of calls to action. Um, and it was to, to do with the barren grounds. I had a librarian um, email me uh, late last year, or earlier this year, and they told me the story of uh, a, a kid who had come into the library and was looking for a book to, to read. And librarian uh, gave them a book that they thought they might enjoy. So the kid brought it away and and left and you know presumably read the book that night or started the book that night and the next day the kid came back and the, and, and gave the librarian back um, the book that they had been given and and said I didn't really like this book um, I read a bit of it but I didn't finish it and so the librarian said okay well let's try another one so she um, gave the kid uh, another book and the kid took the book away and. The next day was back again and gave the librarian back the book and said, I didn't like this one either too much. Uh, I didn't finish it either. 
So the librarians, you know, undeterred said, okay, so gave the kid the Baron grounds and you know, the, the kid came, left with the Baron grounds and the next day came back with the Baron grounds and the librarian thought, okay, um, here we will, I'll think of another book to give this kid. So the kid said, I finished this book and I loved it. And I'd like to say it was because the book is so awesome, but what it was, was because, um, and what the kid expressed to the librarian was that they were a foster kid and they were Cree and the Baron grounds, the great bear, the stone child, the books in the Miswa saga are about two Cree foster kids. And that kid had never read a book with a free Cree foster kid before in their entire lives. Um, and I've heard that time and time again, you know, even with a local advocate, Michael read at Champagne, um, he said as well, when he read the Baron grounds, I had never read a book with a Cree foster kid. So that that's the power of representation. And, um, and I've seen it again and again and again. Um, so the books that we stock on shelves and libraries, the books that we bring into the classroom, they matter, they, they matter big time. Um, they create change. And I often say, and they teach. And then I often say, especially the last year or so, the more you know, the better you do. The more you know, the better you do. Knowledge turns into action. And we are in the business of reconciliation. We should be, we are, we have to be. Um, and reconciliation, this process that we're on, the path that we're walking, it involves everybody. It involves every single person in this country or should, because it's not indigenous history, it's Canadian history. And if we are Canadian, then we have to recognize that we have a responsibility to take to, to figure out what our role is on this path towards healing. Um, and, and that's what it is. It's a path to healing. And as librarians, as educators, um, we are uniquely positioned to have an impact on children. And that is the focused focus. The focus we have to have is preparing kids to make positive changes in their community and enabling them to make better decisions than we have made because they have the knowledge that we did not have. We have barriers as adults that we have to break down because they've been built up for a lot of years. Kids do not have those barriers unless we build them and we cannot build them. We have to instead lay a foundation of truth so that we can build um, on that foundation and, and prepare kids to be leaders, to make change, in their communities and in this country that we need to have so that we can have a country that we can truly be proud of and universally celebrate. Um, one final story, I was ri riding with my family towards a demonstration at the legislature here in Winnipeg after the unmarked graves were discovered in Kamloops. And um, on the way there, we heard about this young girl who was selling lemonade um, it was a, a white girl, uh, about 10 years old. And on the way there, we stopped by to get lemonade. And, um, and a lot of people are stopping by to get lemonade. She was going to donate the money from that lemonade stand to organizations that, that um, supported survivors and, and families of, of survivors who attended residential schools. Um, and so we spent a lot of money on lemonade. A lot of people were overspending on lemonade because they recognized what that girl was donating the money to. And again, Canadians are pretty great. And that girl ended up donating, I think, over a thousand dollars to um, two organizations, one of them being the Indian, Indian Residential School Survivor Society, 10 year old girl. So and why she did that was because she knew the history. She had learned about it in school. She had read books about it. And she decided that she wanted to make, she wanted to be a part of, of positive change. She wanted to make a difference. She figured out her role. And my question to everybody after telling them that story is to figure out what your lemonade stand is going to be, or how are you going to prepare kids to answer that question themselves? What's your role? What can you do? You know, um, because we're all in this together. We are a big community and we have a lot of work. Um, reconciliation will not happen overnight. But if we don't start now, then we're going to be waiting a long time um, for that healing to, to happen. Um, 
And so that that's that's the the talk that I have for you this morning. I just really wanted to just inspire you to um, to 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 do the work, and I know you already are, um, but also to su to support you and to let you know that um, I know that your jobs are hard, and I but I I know I know they are, they are equally important, and um, and I'm I'm really honored to be able to speak with you today um, about 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 representation and about um, diverse literature and and having books available to in the in the in in on the shelves of the library for kids to read and and to learn from and to grow with. So thank you very much for having me out today and I'd love to hear if you have any questions for me. Um, fire away. That was amazing. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Um, seeing ourselves reflected is such a powerful thing. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing. Uh, so we have a few questions. Um, I think you talked about the that list of banned books and it wasn't any Indigenous people who were making that list. It was a, a, a group of non-Indigenous people, right? The banned mm -hmm. book list. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other thing is, one more question. Oh, no, we have about four more, sorry. Um, as library workers, how can we support authors who have had their book removed or banned? Well, you know, all I can say really is, um, I mean, first of all, and in in, I talked a little bit about being bold and make making tough decisions. Um, and sometimes that's when you know something is wrong um, to not listen to those bad decisions that are being made. You know, and if someone tells you not to stock a book that you know is of value, um, fight against that and don't take that book off the shelf you know, is one thing, but, you know, what I've seen um, firsthand in the Great Bear being banned in the Durham District School Board is that the other thing that we can do is step, step up and advocate with or for writers that are going through um, those really def difficult things. You know, that was a really stressful couple months for me. And, um, but I, but it also was made me realize that there's so many people that were, were supporting me. And librarians, teachers, kids, parents across Canada were writing letters into the Durham District School Board, letting them know that they did not agree with that decision and advocating for, for me and my work. And, um, and that, is, that meant a lot to me. And, um, and I've, I spent a lot of my career trying to build strong relationships with people and relationships of trust. And, um, and that to me showed me that it matters to build community. Um, and sometimes it's just speaking up when we can, you know, speaking up when we can and standing up for something that we know isn't right, you know? And I think that that is what I, what I saw happening uh, when the Great Bear was being taken off shelves in that school district. Thank you. Next question. You've shared some names who have inspired you. Can you suggest a few titles that we as library staff can read to educate ourselves and that we can suggest to community? Well, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of them, you know, like um, there's books by Chelsea. I'll tell you some authors that you should be reading. Like obviously Tanya Talaga is someone you should be reading. Chelsea Val is someone you should be reading. Um, you know, Mind Spit on the Ground, Alicia Elliott is someone you should be reading. Katharina Vermette, you should be reading. Richard Van Camp, um, you know, Richard Wagamese, um, you know, Shri Demeline, Tasha Spillett Sumner, uh, Ian Robinson. Um, you know, there's so many right now that are uh, writing good literature, meaningful literature that everybody should be reading. Um, and it's really inspiring to see that happening um, and to see um, the, 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 um, the ways in which Canadians are embracing these stories and learning from them, and it, it it does create change. You know, it really will. And and Tom King is still around doing his thing. You know, and and um, and I, you know, he as I said, he was a big hero of mine. And back then, there weren't very many to uh, Indigenous writers to read. You know, there was Tom King and Lee Miracle, who we just lost, and Maria Campbell, and um, and and Beatrice Culleton, Mazanier, um, you know, in search of Abel Raintree, but like that, but there's more today than there were yesterday. And the goal is to have more, yes, more tomorrow than there are today. 
Um, and But it's hard not to find good literature by Indigenous writers right now. Uh, and that's a good problem to have, uh, but we need to make it a bigger problem, you know, <laughs> to have more, more and more books to choose from and read because um, it's vital literature. And I would say it's vital literature from any diverse uh, marginalized group, you know, like um, in the black community and the Asian community and the LGBTQIA community, like the, the, those books are the books that we should be reading. You know, I think, I really believe that uh, we, we, because we've been ignored for so long and because our stories have been told by other people for so long, uh, we finally have a platform and um, and that platform is um, is enabling us to reach people with truths that um, they need to hear and read and learn from. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, and this might be a really good time for me to say that the First Nation Communities Read Book Award website went live yesterday. So you can see all of the over 75 nominated titles that were created by Indigenous creators. That's a good one. Another good one is American Indians in Children's Literature. Yes. It's a good resource by uh, Debbie Reese is the uh, person behind that one. So yeah, I always felt like that was kind of the uh, Indigenous Academy Awards, if you could be named one of her best books. <laughs> <laughs> that and the Bird Award. There's a, unfortunately, Bird Awards yeah. aren't around anymore. But um, yeah, there's some there's some definitely good outlets, but um, that promote and and re, and give you know give um, support to financially or um, in recognition, um, and then those those are really important. Yeah, for sure. I think we have time for one more question and then we can wrap up and you can continue on with your uh, your busy day. Uh, <laughs> what kind of library programs do you think we should have to help teach adults about Indigenous history? Well, I think that one of the things that we can do is when we have like story time, when we have like, you know, uh, events that we have, you know, kids in to read stories to, um, to, to invite the parents bring the parents in to take part in those those events to take part in story time to i mean uh, like parents they still need to learn way more than kids do you know because and, and not to say anything bad about parents but like we just didn't know the stuff that kids know today and um and so a lot of adults read middle grade a lot of adults read picture books a lot of you know and and because a lot of vital literature is being written in those areas um, so I think it's like the one thing that comes to the top of my head is making sure that we involve parents in these, in, in these events, uh, we involve parents in the, our community of readers in our libraries. Um, and like reading together is like, you know, uh, parent child, uh, is, is really powerful, you know, reading, reading and learning together, you know, and, and setting up programs that promotes that I think is also you know, really important. Um, so, I, and again, like I'm not a professional in this area, but like, I do know that that that's a really powerful thing. You know, like we do that with our family as well. And um, we go to the library together and, um, you know, we used to live right by a library in, in West End, Winnipeg. And, um, and we walked in and librarians knew us and uh, we would spend time there just like hanging out and uh, picking out books and sitting down on little bean bags and reading together and um, I think that was, those were some really good visits that we had, but um, I know also there's programs like that. And, and I think we should make it, a, make it a point to invite in and welcome, um, you know, parents into the, into those events um, to take part in them and to learn with the kids. Definitely. Um, okay. Well, you know what we have actually have time for one more, really one more this time. Um, re recognize the, the complexity of book bans and censorship. How do you see the public library's role around keeping or discarding books with stereotype stereotypical representations of Indigenous people and That's the library's great. role in buying or not buying current books that contain views we might find personally offensive? Great question. Um, I don't agree with banning any book. Unless it's a book that is like a deliberately hateful, you know. Um, but I do think that those books should be um, um, in some way ear like uh, earmarked or like um, in some way um, um, stocked to make people know that there may be problematic things in that in that book that should be discussed, you know. Um, so like if you have a book with, with a heavy stereotypical representation of indigenous, indigenous people, 
Um, that book should not be pulled, but we definitely need to have some sort of notice that that book does have problematic representations um, because it does warrant discussion, you know, um, and we don't want people reading literature like that without any sort of context and, and, and that growing kind of uh, those negative perceptions I was talking about. So we, we have to have some system by which we can know, we can um, identify those books and maybe put them in a special section or uh, have some sort of, um, you know, some sort of like identifier on them that they can be or are problematic and how they represent um, marginalized groups. Um, but I, I, I really just don't believe in censorship, you know, um, and even in like, you know, books about Indigenous people by non-Indigenous writers, you know, I, I think there's some books that are of great value of, that, of, about Indigenous people written by non-Indigenous writers, you know, if they go about it the proper way, you know, like uh, Secret Path, I, I love that graphic novel by Jeff Lemire and Gord Downey. They work with the family to write that story. And who, who's to say that it's not appropriate when the family says it's appropriate, right? So th there is value in some of those stories. What I would say is that we should give attention to the books by Indigenous writers first, but there is value in books by non-Indigenous writers about Indigenous people if, again, if they've gone about it the right way, uh, done the research, done the work, vetted it properly, all those things. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, David, on, on behalf of everyone here at the OLS and all over the province, I wanna thank you again so much for joining us today. Um, I know that we're taking away a lot of knowledge to uh, think about and to appreciate after hearing you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Zanny. Thank you very much.